Okay, welcome back. So we're getting ready to jump into step two in the big process about where does the foreign key goes. So first, let me just show you this, okay? I don't, I don't necessarily like showing this because they're using char and varchar rather than the in varchar types. I'm just saying. Um, so I don't like this, so I don't particularly show this. But this is just an example of their, their way of, of taking this Visio chart and adding some more stuff to it. Okay. So you guys remember this thing where you have a club member and a locker? And uh, let's say it's optional, optional. A member doesn't actually have to have a locker and not all lockers need to be associated with a, a, a customer, right? I mean, you could have an empty locker, right? Okay, good. And so we have some choices. Uh, one choice would be to put the, the foreign key over here on the right-hand side, put it into locker, or you could put the locker into the left-hand one for club member. And you might think, well, since it's a one-to-one, -one, optional, optional, it probably doesn't matter. And technically you are correct. Technically, it really doesn't matter. However, there's some best practices involved. Okay, which one of these tables between club member and locker is likely to be the most volatile, the one that changes more often? Well, it's probably gonna be the club member table, right? The club member table, is, you know, you're going to add a member and delete a member, you know, that kind of stuff. But the lockers, most likely, unless you renovated the gymnasium, the lockers are most likely not going to change very often. Rarely will you go in and change the locker size or the, or the room that it's in, that kind of stuff. So in that case, it would make sense to put the foreign key in the more volatile of the two. Now, this is not a hard and fast rule. This is a best practice. So the best practice would be put it on the more volatile one so that this guy who ha rarely has any rights to it, don't impose writing to a table that already would not otherwise have a lot of rights going to it. Okay, kind of makes sense? Okay. So let's continue. So what happens if I have a scenario where I have a one-to-one -one mandatory now? Okay. So... I'm going to go in and say um, every employee must have a badge. Okay. My absolutely must have a badge, but I have a, a box full of badges. And so not every badge is associated with an employee. Okay. So I have a box full of them waiting to be assigned to people. So an employee must have a badge, one and only one badge. A badge m may be associated with one employee but not more than one employee and done and I could have some ones here that have not been have not been assigned yet okay where should the foreign key go here all right the the tools in our toolbox for enforcing that minimum cardinality is you go to the foreign key and you tell it whether or not it's null or not null that is the only real tool we have so far and so therefore in order for me for me to to make it so that something is mandatory i have to put the foreign key on the on the table that makes it do that okay so employee badge i need to have it over here in the employee side okay i need to have it on this sounds a little weird remember because you have the optional symbol and then the mandatory symbol right so um I have a badge over here that that is optional and then I have an employee over here where this is mandatory so if I said put it on the optional side you know what I'm talking about we're talking about the symbol so put it on the side with the O not on the side with the little dash okay all right so that, now this is not one of those best practices this is a rule a real honest God rule because in order for me to enforce the mandatory I need to have the foreign key there. Now, by the way, how do you enforce optional? All right, let that phrase sit in your head for just a minute. Enforcing something that's optional? That doesn't exist, does it? Okay, so I don't need to have anything to, for things to be optional. I don't need to have any null or not null kind of things because it's optional, right? Come on, you, you guys understand simple logic, right? Okay. So in a one-to-one -one scenario, um, I would have to put the foreign key over there on the, on the employee side. 
and then to make sure that we accidentally did not get any duplicate badges, okay, like I got badge number 12 and Bob got badge number 12, in case, just to prevent that from happening, I would also put that unique constraint on that foreign key. So that foreign key would both have a not null and a unique, okay. So those are the only two rule, only two weapons I have is null or not null on a foreign key and unique on a foreign key. That's it. That's the only tools I got. And by the way, that's not sufficient. I'm just telling you. Okay. So one to many. This one is the simplest one on the planet to figure out where the foreign key goes. The rule is simple. It always goes on the mini side. Case closed. Doesn't matter if it's optional. Doesn't matter if it's mandatory. Who cares? Always always, always, always is going to be on the mini side. Okay. Perfect rule. Easy. Okay. All right. So what happens if I have a mini to mini, you know, one company can provide many parts and many parts can be provided by uh, a single part can be provided by many companies. So where do the foreign key goes here? Eh, trick question. This requires a foreign, uh, uh, an intersection table, and the foreign keys are found there. So you you don't ever put it on the right hand side. You don't ever put it on the left hand side. You always put it in the one in the middle. Okay. So one to one, you had some some you had to put some brain power on it. If you have mandatory mandatory or optional optional on a one to one, well then you ought to put the foreign key on the more volatile side. If you have one optional and one mandatory, that it goes on the optional side to be able to enforce the mandatory. Okay, so that, that's just a few scenarios. Optional, optional, one-to-one. -one. Mandatory, mandatory, one-to-one. -one. Mandatory, optional, one-to-one. One-to-many, easy. Many-to-many, -many, that's easy too, because the answer is none, neither one. It has to go in the middle one, okay? Whew. Okay, this is, this is tough stuff. No, it's not tough. But this is definitely stuff that's going to be on the quiz. I mean, you're going to have to noodle your head around this. And there's going to be a summary in the in the um, lecture notes that kind of goes through this one more time at the end. So if you, if you grab the lecture notes afterwards, you should be able to do okay. Okay. So this is the kind of technique that we're talking about here. So let's, let's just take a look at this. Um, so a lot of databases do not support a many-to-many -many relationship. For example, SQL Server does not support this relationship. It doesn't. It requires you to build this intersection table in between that, that links these. By the way, it always looks like this. This is always a one-to-many, and this is always a one-to-many, every single time. And if there's one column in the PK here and one column in the PK here, then it's going to be two columns in the PK here. That was a very simple rule, and how do you figure out how many columns are going to be in the primary key. Okay, so let's just kind of sort of do this with, um, with well, no, I'm not. Okay. In Visio, it, it'd be straightforward, right? I, I have an example that I'm going to, I put in uh, lecture notes afterwards, uh, which is, talks about the, it's a Visio chart that talks about the, how to convert from what we used to do in chapter five with a, with a many to many and how we solve that problem in chapter six with an intersection table in between. And the rules for knowing, I, I can tell in advance how many columns are gonna be in the compound primary key. I can tell in advance. Okay, so this intersection table could have like no no data in it whatsoever. It is very possible. But on the other hand, you could you could take it one step further and throw in some extra things. You could, for example, put the, the order number that, the, that the, the company placed, or maybe the order date right? I mean, I already have the part name and the sales price, but maybe I had down here, I put down, you know, my invoice number 402, date is 23rd of March, that kind of stuff. You could just add more stuff, right? If you wanted to. Cool. All right. Phew. All right. So again, chapter six, uh, convert many to many is a, a very good thing you should look at after the lecture notes are produced. So on page 288, they start talking about the ID dependent entities. Okay. So that's what I was describing. Uh, in addition to having a normal intersection table, it's intersection table with data. Okay. So 
it's not really, it's called an association. It, I still call them intersection tables, whether they have data or not, but I'm just saying they kind of make a distinction now. They, and so if it contains data, um, then of course it has an association. All right, cool, whatever. Um, and you're going to need to be able to do this. You're going to need to be able to take, you know, a part number and a company and figure this thing out. Okay, you, you're, you're going to be given scenarios where, okay, I have a many-to-many -many relationship and I need to fix it. Okay, it's just saying. You're going to need to know how to do this. On page 291, they start talking about the multi-valued attribute. Now, there's too many things called multi-valued because it, back in chapter three, we were talking about normal forms. There's something called multi-valued in there, but that's not what we're talking about. So I don't use that term. I use multi-column problem. It's a little bit easier to understand and it's less confusing because you, you know darn well I'm not talking about normal forms. Okay, so if I have a table that has part numbers in it, uh, okay, I'm okay. But if I go in there and say, I want a bunch of phone numbers, so there's another example coming up in lecture notes talking about how you would would have a bunch of tables with phone numbers. So one more time, if I go in here and say phone one and phone two and phone three. Okay, that's a multi-column issue because I would have, as a database designer, I would have to know in advance that there's three and exactly three. Never ever four, and that just sucks. I don't want to be, you know, if, if it were me and I was forced to do this, if somebody said, well, what's the maximum number of phones a customer has ever had? And they go look through the data. Well, it looks like this guy over here has got five phones. I probably said, well, great, I'll, I'll pick six. But that's just dumb. So instead of doing it that way, I need to break this thing up into two pieces. I need to have the regular customer table, right? With the first name, and last name, right? and email address, and this stop, and then have a phones table that's got the customer ID, and then maybe you wanna preserve the order in which these things show up. Like, it's possible that the reason why there's a phone one, two, and three is you wanted to call the first one the first time. If no one answers, you go to the second one, that kind of a thing. So I'm just gonna call this one phone order. And that's presupposing that there's merit in the order in which they are. Like if this was list of names of your children on an insurance form, you know, there's no there's no merit in which one goes first. And then the phone number. Okay, so I've taken this one giant table and I've broken it up. So this guy, of course, is going to be the... And this is going to have to be both of these guys. Why? Because I'm going to have duplicates. And this guy is also participating as a foreign key. Okay, you see how I did that? You're gonna to need to know how to do this. Now there's an Excel spreadsheet. It's in lecture notes that maybe will draw this a little bit more attention. It shows an example where breaking it up is easy. And then another one where you have a normal form issue where you're gonna to have to solve the, the thing. Okay, so look for chapter three. Chapter three, multi-column, okay? It's been out there a while, but take a peek at it. Okay, I'm gonna skip the arch type and weak entities and mixed and super type and subtypes. All those things aren't very useful. And let's talk about the recursive relationship one more time on page 295. So this is a relationship with itself, okay? All right. So an employee and then the employee each row in the employee has the name of the, their manager. So I'm saying that every employee must have, I, this is a little weird, optional and optional. I, I, don't, I don't buy that, but okay. Hey, look, who am I to argue? Um, this is the foreign key that goes back to the primary key of the very same table. Okay, this is probably a good place to stop for the 15 minute mark. You guys know how this works.